Well, good morning, everybody. My name is Daria Schooler, and I live in Indiana, and I'm a retired neurosurgeon, and my uh, undergrad was in pharmacy, and I was, I'm a licensed pharmacist as well in the state of Indiana. And uh, last year, I, uh, when I was here at my first meeting, I talked about chocolate and the health benefits associated with that. So there's a little common theme here, of pulling back into, again, neuroscience and pharmacology and other things. So I love the multidisciplinary aspect of what we're doing here. And uh, I wasn't sure what to talk about, and Paulina suggested that we try and clarify what the difference is between A2 cows and A1 cows. So that's what the premise of this, that's where the springboard for this talk topic was. Uh, so we, we're going to go into talking about bovine milk proteins and human disease. And the first thing we want to look at is uh, what, what are the goals of this presentation? And what I'd like to do is provide some insight into the difference between cow's milk containing A2 beta casein and that containing A1 beta casein and the relationship to type 1 diabetes mellitus incidence and ischemic heart disease using a utilization of the literature. Uh, our first objective is to identify the molecular metabolite of A1 beta casein protein, the beta casomorphin 7, uh, which is uh, exposed during uh, enzymatic digestion in the uh, GI tract with discussion of its uh, identified pharmacologic properties. Our second objective is to discuss the correlation of human consumption of A1 beta casein containing milk products and the occurrence of type 1 diabetes and ischemic heart disease in different populations. And thirdly, discuss additional contributing factors in the development of type 1 diabetes mellitus which il illustrate a1 beta casein alone cannot explain the development of this condition uh, in all populations. So historically, since at least the late 1990s, uh, and perhaps even going back into the late 80s, medical literature has identified two genetic subtypes of beta casein in cow's milk. The older form of A2 beta casein varies from the more recent appearance of A1 beta casein, primarily in cow cattle of European origin. Uh, European cattle breeds uh, <clears throat> by a single amino acid substitution of histidine from the original proline at position 67 on the casein molecule. And there's 209 amino acids in the bovine casein protein. This single mutation results in a casein molecule that is metabolized in the gut to yield a bioactive peptide, beta casomorphin 7 which binds with opioid receptors in the gut as well as in the central nervous system. Uh, now, in terms of just looking at modern cattle, uh, the Guernsey cows do produce predominantly A2 beta casein, unless there was some crossbreeding. Uh, Jersey cows are also cattle that predominantly will produce A2 beta casein. And it's interesting because they're both yellow in color. Then you have our poor little Holstein Friesian cows, they're black and white, and they primarily produce A1 beta casein. Uh, this is the molec molecular change here, if you can see that slide. The A2 beta casein has a number of prolanes, but this is the one in particular right here at position 67 that provides a very strong bond. And as a surgeon, I can tell you proline suture, you can't break it. You have to cut it with scissors. Um, a1 beta casein breaks off into this heptapeptide right here, beta casomorphin 7, because of that histidine amino acid substitution that happened as a basically a chance mutation about possibly 2,000 years ago. Now, from a biochemical standpoint, beta casomorphin 7 is a particularly stable molecule on account of those uh, three of those seven amino acids being proline. However, it is evident that BCM7 can be degraded by the enzyme dipeptidyl peptidase 4, DPP4, that is found on cell surfaces within the mesenteric tissues. It is also apparent that in many people, the intestinal lining combined with the presence of DPP4, in other words, intact tight junctions in the gut, is sufficient to prevent the BCM7 from passing through into the bloodstream. However, there is also evidence that in people with a range of for a range of reasons, have leaky guts, it is possible for BCM7 to be absor absorbed into the bloodstream. Leaky gut conditions we're all familiar with. Newborn babies, uh, their tight junctions uh, apparently don't really develop well until about 12 months of age. Celiac disease, 
ulcerative colitis, Crohn's disease, and stomach ulcers. So autoimmune inflammatory processes uh, will lead to the leaky gut, which then can cause the side effect of uh, absorption of BCM7 from the consumption of A1 beta casein containing cow's milk. And exercise. And right after exercise, we all have a leaky gut. Okay, thank you. Yes. So yeah, chocolate milk and cookies, uh, we'll get to that in a minute. <laughs> now from a pharmacological standpoint, bovine BCM7 is a strong opioid, which can be counteracted by high doses of naloxone due to the strong binding affinity of BCM7 to opiate receptors. And what's interesting is it has been found to, uh, studies have shown that it takes about 10 times more naloxone to counteract the effect of BCM7 than it does for a similar uh, dose of morphine. That's how powerful this bind, binding is to opiate receptors, both in the gut and in the nervous system. It, just one animal trial, sh uh, several animal trials showed that in rodents, BCM7 easily crosses the blood brain barrier and leads to bizarre behavior patterns, uh, getting into psychiatry issues, similar to those observed in autism and schizophrenia. Uh, in human disease, several groups have shown autistic humans typically excrete BCM7 in their urine from ingested A1 bovine milk. Human milk can also release BCM7 when digested in the gut, but only in small quantities. And the human BCM7 peptide is a much weaker opioid, or, excuse me, opioid than bovine BCM7. Uh, from a molecular standpoint, the stability of A2-beta casein is not broken down into the beta casomorphin 7 molecule, and therefore the risk of ischemic heart disease related to milk that does not contain A1 beta casein is suspected to be reduced. A lot of the research on this is from New Zealand and Australia. That's where uh, the biggest interest was generated first. Beta casomorphin 7 in its relationship to atherosclerosis. B BCM7 has been characterized not only as an opioid receptor agonist, but also as a peptide with the ability to catalyze the oxidation of LDL in a non-cation dependent fashion. Uh, and this is mainly because it is hypothesized that the tyrosine uh, amino acid that's on the opposite end of that histidine uh, has oxidative properties with LDL. Then, of course, everyone knows that the uptake of oxidized LDL by endothelium-bound macrophages has been widely implicated in the pathogenesis of atherosclerosis. The, again, the fascinating epidemiological studies elicited this and started having investiga investigators suspicious about this exposure to this, this particular peptide coming from the A1 beta casein protein that's in um, milk derived from cattle with that gene. Uh, countries with high type 1 diabetes were also countries with high levels of ischemic heart disease. Again, getting back to Jeff's talk. From a public health perspective, it suggests that there are common factors that influence the level of both type 1 diabetes and heart disease. Uh, this slide is a little bit busy. I, don't, I hope you can see it in the back. But one of the studies, and this is from the New Zealand Med Medical Journal, and this guy, McLaughlin, uh, he's actually a chemical engineer background. And he's a professor of chemical engineering in uh, New Zealand. Uh, but uh, he looked at coronary uh, ischemic heart disease mortality per 100,000 males ages 30 to 69 across different nations. And the annual insulin-dependent diabetes mellitus incidence per 100,000 males less than 15 years of age. And saw this striking uh, plot that in Japan, so Asia, and then you've got uh, Europe, France, Israel, uh, you get a little further north, you get into Scandinavia, and Finland really had a lot of bad luck here with uh, the high incidence of both of these conditions. Uh, and then the next death rate that was reviewed was death rates from ischemic heart disease in males aged 30 to 69, again, plotting that graph. And this was the uh, interesting epidemiological finding, the, uh, it, correlating it with A1 beta casein consumption outside of cheese in grams per day in volume. And again, the plot looks very similar to the prior one that just showed the incidence of the diabetes type 1 and the ischemic heart disease across those same group of nations. So clearly something's going on here. Uh, and it, again, multiple factors have to be considered. But 
getting back to the etiology of, of how this works and the mechanism of action, evidence does suggest that type 1 diabetics have, been, have enhanced levels of antibodies to A1 beta casein. German research has shown that type 1 diabetics, the ratio of A1 to A2 beta casein antibodies is higher than for case controls with a high uh, coefficient there. BCM7, the role in type 1 diabetes. The four amino acids, again, this is a hypothesis of the mechanism of action of how this can help to cause people to develop type 1 diabetes, children in particular, that uh, the four amino acids at the end of the BCM molecule is pro, uh, proline, glycine, proline, isoleucine, is identical to a sequence with, uh, within the GLUT2 molecule, which is the glucose transporting molecule inside insulin producing cells within the pancreas, so suggesting possibly a cross allergy. Uh, and that it is hypothesized that these antibodies to BCM7 are attacking through cross reactivity to the GLUT2 molecule, thereby destroying the insulin producing cells. Sequence homologies exist between beta casein and several other pancreatic beta cell molecules as well. And again, we're looking now at new cases of type 1 diabetes per 100,000 individuals and the A1 beta casein uh, per capita consumption looking across nations. And a number of these, these all are obviously, uh, except for perhaps Venezuela, but the uh, incidence seems to go up as you go north and with the exposure to the A1 beta casein in the milk and the amount of consumption of that milk as well. Uh, again, there are other variables we'll touch on later. So. Since other factors do play a role in the development of type 1 diabetes, the presence of A1 beta casein in milk products is potentially a contributing factor to developing the disease. And like Jeff said, it, you do oftentimes require multiple things to go wrong to have the manifestation of the illness. Uh, I always liken it to a plane crash. When every time a plane crash happens and uh, TSA looks into what happened, uh, is that the right, I'm not sure that's the right agency, I apologize. but. Uh, what the FAA, sorry, uh, what they find is that there were multiple failures of uh, variables that happened to lead to that plane crash. It wasn't just one thing went bad in most cases. So the same thing could be here, including uh, viral illness, vitamin D deficiency, looking at those higher uh, latitude countries that are affected. Uh, now, and then here's another uh, diagram that shows all these different variables coming together and the immunomodulatory uh, uh, modulatory components of the diet, dietary antigens of other uh, sources, including the milk, viral infections, growth hormones and cytokines from breast milk, colonization with bacteria. And then you have your genetic predisposition over here, uh, how this all impacts on gut-associated lymphoid tissue, uh, the development of a disturbance of oral tolerance, and the relationship of inflammation, increased gut permeability, all leading to autoimmunity. So it is suggested that in type 1 diabetes mellitus, a deficient oral tolerance to dietary components, including those of cow's milk, promotes islet inflammation and disease development. So in looking at uh, reducing infant risk of developing type 1 diabetes mellitus, this will sound very familiar, and it's funny because it was approached from people in the agriculture industry, including, I'll pass this book around, uh, Keith Woodford. The guy's an agriculturalist, but he got so passionate about the A1 versus A2 milk issue that he compiled all this research and wrote this book. And so I'll, I'll start passing that around. People can look at that. Uh, but obviously, breastfeeding in, of infants and delaying exposure to cow's milk protein correlates with a decreased incidence of type 1 diabetes mellitus in infants. Now, in terms of, oh, these are the uh, Jersey calves, little baby cows. Uh, and, and so we're looking at pediatric conditions now. So in child development, again, getting back to some of the neuroscience issues, it has been, sh uh, BCM7 has been shown to enter the blood of babies fed milk formula diets in a Russian study. Babies that are slow metabolizers of BCM7, perhaps they don't have as much of that DPP4 enzyme that they need, uh, that, that maintained higher blood levels between feedings, also correlated with a higher risk of delayed psychomotor development. Another study showed that in sudden infant death syndrome, 
that BCM7 has been sub suspected as a risk factor for SIDS, and this has also been considered for about 20 years. Casomorphins have been found in the brain stems of children who have died from SIDS. Babies suffering from acute apnea events, near-death type apnea episodes, had circulating levels of BCM7 three times higher than normal children. And the studies are listed at the bottom of the slide, and this is on the Dropbox for anybody that wants to look at this in more detail. Also, I have a bunch of, I did print off a lot of the articles that I was reading for this, as well as many more online. Um, from an autism standpoint, BCM7, we know, crosses the blood-brain barrier in animal studies and leads to autistic type behavior. Interestingly, milk elimination trials have produced positive results with some autistic kids. Many autistic children, interestingly enough, also have digestive problems which may increase risk of BCM7 absorption. Again, getting back to the leaky gut. Um, and I didn't really, I, this is one of those rabbit holes I didn't have time to go down uh, within the time frame of this talk. So, but just to be aware, BCM7 is also suspected of affecting the serotonergic system. And that could be another mechanism by which this occurs. So in summary, now here's uh, African cattle, predominantly A2. Except where some European cattle may have been introduced, the, the bulk of the genetic profile and the bulk of milk production is the A2 milk. And I just got a kick out of this picture because I kept thinking of when we went to grade school in the ca uh, grade school cafeteria, you had those big milk silver machines and they had that big ball thing on it. That's how we got our milk. <laughs> school kids probably just go out there and tap their own when, they're, <laughs> when it's lunchtime. <laughs> but uh, yeah, beautiful though. So again, the first uh, point I want to make is that the issues discussed here relate to a peptide called beta casomorphin 7, which is found in cow's milk, primarily cattle of European origin. This peptide is released on digestion from the A1 beta casein molecule, and it is not released on digestion from A2 beta casein. Secondly, beta casomorphin 7 is a heptapeptide with opioid characteristics and a strong affinity for mu opioid receptors. Its derivative, BCM5, has even stronger opioid activity. The original uh, evolutionarily beta casein protein in bovine milk was A2 and is a predominant form of milk in the Asian cattle, Bos indicus is the Latin, whereas the Bos taurus in the European cattle, that breed, is more likely going to, you're going to find the A1 or a combination of A1, A2 manifestation. So this probably occurred some thousands of years ago, which is carried by a proportion of cows of European breeds. The difference in A1 and A2 beta casein is the amino acid histidine rather than proline at position 67. So human milk, goat milk, sheep milk, and other species are A2-like with proline at the equivalent position. Susceptibility to BCM7-related health conditions is linked to the peptide being able to pass through the digestive system into the circulatory system. All babies have permeable digestive systems and are particularly susceptible to BCM7 passing into the circulatory system. Tight junctions that reduce passage of BCM7 form progressively and during, during and subsequent to the first 12 months of age. At-risk children and adults are those who, for any range of reasons, have a leaky gut. This may be associated with conditions such as stomach ulcers, ulcerative colitis, Crohn's disease, and celiac disease. Antibiotic treatment and viruses may also affect gut permeability. Uh, in, uh, I believe it was a Danish study, uh, there was a correlation between a higher incidence of schizophrenia in patients with ulcerative colitis than in the general population. The only known enzyme that can break down BCM7 is dipeptidylpeptidase 4. This enzyme is found on mesenteric cells lining the digestive system. DPP4 is also found in the blood and other tissues. Low levels of DPP4 are likely to be an additional risk factor for BCM7 related conditions. These low levels may be due to genetic factors. Alternatively, they may be caused by artificial reduction through DPP4 inhibiting drugs such as those used in the treatment of type 2 diabetes. Uh, if, there's a, if there's no tight junction problem, then we look at some of the gut side effects of opioids in the intestinal tract. 
And one of the uh, thoughts is that if you're consuming A1 beta casein containing milk, and there's a development of lactose intolerance in individuals, if it's, it can be potentially compounded by the fact that the BCM7 is slowing down gut motility. And therefore, the lactose in the milk has more time to ferment and create some of the GI side effects that people see that have this lactose intolerance. So allergy, intolerance, uh, the uh, biochemistry of this mechanism and the pharmacology of this all sort of play on each other and compound the problem. There are more than 250 medical and scientific papers relating to casomorphins and their effects in the PubMed database. You can look, uh, search, and oh, Bob, thank you for turning me on to Scholar Google. That was awesome. Anyway, so in conclusion, you want to consider in your patients the effects of BCM7 in patients presenting with these diseases associated with BCM7, ischemic heart disease, diabetes, uh, psychological conditions, autism. Uh, also, there's some thought that there, there may be a, a linkage even with issues like uh, multiple sclerosis, so the autoimmune diseases as well. So a good dietary history is very important here. You want to avoid A1 beta casein containing milk in individuals with gut permeability issues. And then ideally, um, to at least eliminate this as a potential disease contributor in the population, increased consumer demand for pure A2 beta casein milk will lead to increased supply as cattle herds are bred over to A2 producing cows over time thereby eliminating this one dietary va variable from contributing to human disease. And it's very easy to do and very inexpensive. You just have to get semen from A2, A2 bulls and breed that with your cows and each subsequent generation will have a higher proportion of A2 containing milk until you can get a, a pure herd. And this is quietly being done in New Zealand and Australia over time. And one of the PhD theses I looked at, and again, this is from the agricultural literature, found that A2 beta casein producing cattle usually have a higher milk production anyway. So there's a lot of good reasons to make this transition. And it was just fascinating reading. I haven't even quite gotten through one of the last chapters in that book about food safety. But you'd be amazed at the uh, politics and, and uh, government regulatory issues that come into play here. It's, it's kind of like our uh, corrupted uh, uh, food uh, pyramid that the government puts out and how flawed it is. But yet they continue to do so potentially because of lobby interests. And uh, there's also an issue with um, this topic being suppressed by warped research, you know, corrupted samples, uh, uh, distorted uh, interpretations of the research data. And that's one of the things Dr. Woodford in his book was very good at teasing out, getting you back to pure scientific methods. So you have to really be discriminatory in your reading of research. Are we done? Okay. Five minutes. Okay. And then, oh, for everyone, if you want to try it, we've got two A2 milks back here. I went to Sprouts and got these. There, you can actually buy A2 milk, at least here in Phoenix, from A2 cows and goat's milk, all A2. No A1 at all. Um, also, babies that were given formula that contain just whey, whey-based formulas, were not having the same issues. So getting rid of that casein molecule in baby formulas is helpful. But it was, again, very fascinating topic, and I want to thank everybody very much. So we've got your Jersey cow over here smoking a cigarette, <laughs> saying you ought to get them their spots looked at. <laughs> Poor little Holstein cow, can't take a break. So. Um, that was another condition, uh, Parkinson's disease. <laughs> There's a little blurb in there about Parkinson's disease and dopamine receptors. And they actually found in uh, one of the epidemiological studies that there was less Parkinson's disease in cigarette smokers than non-cigarette smokers. This is like a trivia thing, and probably because of the dopamine levels, something with dopamine. And I don't know, go figure. But you can understand after reading through this whole thing that uh, it's perfectly understandable the appeal for cookies and milk, ice cream, and there's a whole thing about in the, in the dairy industry, a discussion of the different types of pasteurization processes used for preparing different types of milk-based foods and how that can potentially increase the exposure to the breakdown into the BCM7. 
uh, enzymatically. So it was a fun, to a fun topic to look into. Yeah, the homogenization, exactly. Everything that can expose those amino acids. Two minutes for questions. Okay. Thank you, Dario. So your last comment was my question. Whey protein, no matter what kind of milk it's from, doesn't break down into the... Right, because it's only in the casein. And I think one, somebody, it might have been you talked about caseins last year and how bad they were. Or I can't remember who no, it was. That's interesting. Just because people have whey protein smoothies after they right. have a lot right. of whey protein. Right. right. A lot right. of it's contaminated with casein, though. No. It can be. Well, right, right. right. From the processing, huh? so. Yeah, it's not pure whey. No, yeah. yeah. But if it were pure whey, it would be, yeah. it would be digested. Sure. So what's the issue with cheese? That's a good question. Um, part of the difficulty with identifying this is finding the right assays. There's been tons of research into getting the proper assays, assays like you were talking about with looking at diabetes and getting the right insulin test. Um, the, the lab, there's a myriad of papers in the uh, basic science literature about uh, getting the proper assays to test for these things. But there's some issues with cheese where the fermentation process uh, of creating cheese actually varies in the amount of A1 beta casein that could be left over to form beta casomorphin. And blue vein cheeses have more of that released in the fermentation process, so less gut exposure. And whereas whiter cheeses like mozzarella and cheddar, um, the, the process of uh, whatever those, that enzymatic, I'm sorry, fermentation process with the organisms doesn't release as much of that breakdown product up front, so there's more, more of it that intact beta, A1 beta casein that could be turned into BCM7 in the gut. Yeah, mozzarella is not fermented at all. Right, so you're gonna have, it's gonna be pretty much a straight exposure. But uh, looking at the different homogen, uh, the pasteurization processes and the temperature differentials, that has to do a lot with potentially how much uh, of the beta casein molecule is broken down past the point where it is uh, not going to release this heptapeptide. So water buffalo from Africa, you know, they import the Romans brought them in 2,000 years ago, and so they have mozzarella de buffalo, which is the buffalo, right. water buffalo, cow's milk. Are they A1 or A2? Uh, that's a really good question. I think it's just a matter of, is it A2? Thank you. Um, I, I didn't come across that, so I didn't know, but that's an excellent question. But okay. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, there's another. There's another milk protein, um, beta cellulin, which is also linked to type one diabetes and gut permeability. Is, is, did you come across that? In, no, I uh, didn't. But um, it wouldn't surprise me if it's the difference is between the water soluble proteins that are in milk and the uh, non water soluble and casein and possibly your protein that you're talking about kind of travel together. They may be fellow travelers, but I'm not 100 percent sure about that. But, and, and it was really funny because even in some of the clinical studies looking at BCM7, uh, it, and again, it was people in the laboratory research community that look at you know, chemistry lab techniques. You can actually, since it is such a hydrophobic molecule, um, you, it can drop out of your assay depending on like what kind of flask you run the test in. So people can get false data just because of research technique. And, uh, but it's, it, yeah, looking at what happened with all these trials, and where some uh, critics of this theory, this A, it's called the A2 hypothesis, were coming from saying, oh, it doesn't matter health-wise if you drink A1 milk versus A2 milk, actually were a bit disingenuous because they were relying on flawed research. Their, uh, you know, what the rats were given and, and, uh, in terms of like baseline food. Uh, there were whole diets that were confounded by having A1 casein through uh, like a baseline food formula, um, and that was supposed to be totally an A2 animal uh, exposed in the test. So when they said there was no difference in the outcomes, it's because, well, they were both given something that had A1 in it, and splitting it out into A1 and A2 later really didn't help, so it didn't show a difference. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not scientifically explaining that as well as I could, but yes? Oh, we got to, sorry, we got to wrap oh. up. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. All right, thanks. Thank you.